A couple of weeks ago, Figma announced one of the most impactful features in the history of the program, and I'm not exaggerating. The feature I'm talking about is called variables, and I would go as far as to say that it's a feature that all designers should start using immediately, no matter the type of design work you might do. Even if you're not into prototyping, it can save you a whole lot of time when designing or when trying to maintain brand guidelines. And for prototyping specifically, it's a game changer. We no longer have to rely on complex networks of screens to describe simple concepts. This prototype, for example, is just one screen, something that would have been impossible to do before, or to be more accurate, we would have to rely on a lot of hacks to make it work. So in this video, we'll dig deeper into what kind of things we can do with variables, and hopefully by the end of it, you'll be excited enough to start using it in your own work. Let's go. With variables, we can store values that we can reuse later on. We can also update them dynamically when certain actions are triggered. But instead of talking theory, let's see things in a more practical manner with a couple of examples. For now, just keep in mind that we can store four types of variables. Colors, numbers, strings, which is basically text, and finally, Boolean operations, meaning whether something is true or false. You can find all the examples we're going to work with on my website, so if you want to follow along, just go ahead and download them. The link is in the description below. Now, let's start with a prototyping example first, and then we can talk about variables and design work. So, in this prototype, we want to showcase how the cart system works. When we click on the plus icon, we want the item number to increase and to also update the total amount. There's no way for us to predict how many times a user will click on a specific product or even in what order. So something like this before variables were introduced was really tricky to do. It was basically an on rails experience. So let's see what sort of thing we need to make this work. We basically have to have a way to store four things. First off, the product name and the price. Then we need to store how many times a user clicked on each of these buttons. And finally, a way to calculate the total cost based on the amount of products clicked and their cost. We can do all these things with two of Figma's variables, the number variable and the string variable. So let's start building things up. To access the variables section, we have to click on an empty area. If we have a frame or an object selected, the info won't show up. As you can see, I already have the variables prepared, but let's start from scratch. Perfect. Let's start with the product details first, and let's create a new collection. Collections are a way to group variables together. It's mainly a way for us to make things more understandable. We'll call this collection product list. Now let's start with the names of the products. We'll add a string variable and let's call it product name. Since we have three products, we'll need three columns and let's call them product one, two, and three. We'll use this text field to write the name of each product. The one we see on the first row of each product line. We could just type the text on the text box in the frame of our design, but keep in mind that we want to keep things as dynamic as possible. If we have, for example, the product on multiple screens, we only have to change the name once. Perfect. Now let's define how much each product will cost. This will allow us to calculate the total amount. We'll need a numbers variable to do that. And let's call this one price. Type in whatever number you want for each product. I chose three different prices and I would advise you to do the same just so it's easier to debug things if something goes wrong. Okay, now we need to store how many times the user clicked on each one of these products. And to do that, we're going to need another numbers variable. The nicer way to do it would be to have it in this collection underneath each product, but currently there's a bug and if we do it that way, it won't work. The feature is still in beta after all, so it's understandable. Just keep in mind though for future use. So to circumvent this, we'll store these values individually in three different variables. Let's create a new collection and let's call it product count. 
and let's create three number variables for product 1, 2, and 3. The initial value should be 0 since we want the user to pick the total number of products himself. This variable will be updated dynamically based on the user's interaction with the buttons. Now the final variable we'll need is for the total amount. So let's create a new collection, call it cart, add a new numbers variable, and let's call this one cart total. And again, let's have the default value as zero. Okay, we're all good. Let's now start connecting things. And let's start with the names of the products. Select the first text box. And by the way, you can easily select nested objects easily just by holding down the command key or control key and clicking the object. Now, as you can see in the text properties, we have this hexagonal icon. Here we can pick between the different variables and let's pick the product name property. And as you can see, the moment we did that, the name changed in the text box. Figma automatically picked the first item in the product string because we use the same naming conventions. But in case we don't have that, we can pick the item we want by going to the layer section and in the hexagonal icon here, we can pick between the three different products. Great. Now let's repeat the same procedure for the other two products. The other thing we need to do is change the pricing displayed on the second line. It's the same process as before. With the text selected, we pick the price variable. Just make sure that the correct price is selected in the layer section of the properties. Okay, with the easy stuff out of the way, let's figure out the rest of the prototype. The product amount we see here has to be linked with the product count variable of each product. So let's do that. The first product will have the product count of product one, product two, the product count of two, and three, the count of product three. Excellent. The way to increase and decrease that number will be with the plus and minus icons. So essentially, we need to tell Figma that when the user clicks on the plus icon, it needs to increase the product count by one and the opposite with a minus icon. So let's do that. Let's switch to the prototype context and let's pick the plus icon of the first product. We'll add an interaction that says on click, set the product count of product one to whatever the value of product one was plus one. So let's test that. Hit shift and space and as expected, hitting the plus icon increases the value by one. What we have essentially done here was this. If we go to the product count variable, we increase this zero value to one. That's it. Now we also need to change the cart total, which is this text box here. In order to do that, we need to add something extra to our prototype. So let's go back to our interaction and let's add one more thing. We need another variable that changes the cart total. So let's change the cart total to whatever the cart value was, plus the price of product one. If you remember, our product variable has three options. So let's click again on the price variable and now we can access all the different prices. Perfect. Let's test things again. Shift space and if we click on the plus icon, <laughs> nothing happens. Well, that's because I forgot to link the text box at the bottom of the screen with the right variable. So <laughs> let's select the zero on our frame and let's link it with the cart total variable. Now, if we refresh the prototype, it works as expected. As we add more products, the total amount updates correctly. Now we need to do the opposite for the minus icon. So we need to set the product count of product one to whatever the value of product one is minus one. And of course we need to update the cart total to whatever the value is minus the price of product one. Perfect. Let's test it out. Shift space. And as we click on the button, the product number increases and the total amount increases too. And the other way around for the minus button. Excellent. Notice though one small thing. When we decrease the number below zero, 
we get into the negative territory and we definitely don't want that. So we need to add a condition that says if the value is zero, don't do anything. So let's adjust our prototype to accommodate that. Let's add a condition that says if the product count of product one is not equal to zero, then do all the rest. Currently, the way things are laid out means that this condition will trigger last. So let's put the other two variables inside the condition. We just need to collapse both of them and add them in the if section. And now if we refresh the prototype by hitting R, things should work as expected. We go up, we go down, and once we hit zero, nothing happens. Perfect. Now, the only thing we need to do is repeat the same process for the other two products. I'm just gonna copy the buttons of the first product and paste them to the other ones. Of course, we need to make sure that we change the variables to the right product. So wherever we have product one, we need to adjust it to product two and three. I'm gonna fast forward through the process, but be super careful and go through the changes slowly. If it's not set up correctly, the prototype won't work as expected. And hopefully, once that is done, we'll have a prototype that does what we want. Let's hit R to refresh. And it's all good. Excellent. So in just one screen, we managed to create a rather extensive interaction, something that could only be done in a hacky way just a few weeks ago. So that's the prototyping part. Let's see now how variables can help us in the design process. We essentially have a foolproof way to ensure that everything we design sticks to the brand's guidelines, from colors to distances between elements, and how everything will reflow based on screen width. For example, here we have a spacing collection where we've defined preset distances between elements. These are just plain number variables, there's nothing special to them. And now we can go to an element and adjust the spacing based on these presets. Let's go to apply variable and then let's pick the big space option. By using these variables, we take the guesswork out of the equation. We know for sure that everything is built to the guidelines we've set up in our file, which is great for both us and the client. Of course, you need to do a better job than I did in this file. This is just a simple example to showcase what's possible. We can set up these types of presets for colors too. Here, I've created a collection with color variables for different parts of the design. Brand colors, text colors, etc. Here's where things get interesting and why color variables can be super powerful. We can reference a variable inside another variable. As you can see, the header variable references the brand color variable. So if we need to make an adjustment that requires big changes on the brand's colors, we only need to make a change once and all these changes will propagate to all the different elements that use this color. So how do we go about creating this reference? It's super easy. If we create a new color variable and now right click on the color value, we have the option to create an alias. Then it's just a matter of picking the right color. And that's it, fast and simple. The last thing I want to show you is the ability to create responsive elements with variables. So here I've built this simple card element. As I resize it, the content reflows accordingly. So far so good. What we want to do now is have the ability to have the card element reflow automatically based on the screen size. I've already set up the widths I think work best with this card element. So I've created two number variables with two widths. 800 and 500. Let's assign the variable to the width of our widget. The card automatically resizes to accommodate the variable. Excellent. Now, if we add this to the big screen underneath, it will look good, but if we move it to the small screen, most of the card is out of bounds. The missing key to make this work is to tell Figma what width the frame should take into account. So with a frame selected, we can go to the layer properties and pick screen two. And now our card is resized automatically. We can do the same for the big screen here. We move the card to that frame and adjust the variable selection. And that's it. 
Now, every time we move our card between the two screens, the card resizes automatically. As you can see, there's so much potential with variables, and I'm hoping that their abilities will be extended even more in the coming months. There are still things we cannot do that easily, so hopefully the team will just keep adding to the feature set. Anyway, I think that about wraps things up for this video. If you have any questions, let me know in the comments below. Take care, and I'll see you in the next one.